All right. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our fourth session of Outside the Rails. It's a series that we've been doing with Green MLAs to uh, discuss bills that they're working on right now to bring into the uh, spring sitting of the legislature, uh, which, of course, spring starts uh, early this year, just like the Groundhog said. February 25th, they're going to be back in the legislature. And um, so we've already had sessions uh, in the last couple of weeks with, uh, with Lynn Lund uh, talking about her Environmental Bill of Rights, Hannah Bell talking about her uh, Poverty Strategy and Elimination Bill. Um, Carla Bernard was on talking about um, her bills to lower the uh, voting age to 16 and to um, uh, require educational authorities such as school boards to have uh, modern sexual misconduct policies. And today we're joined by uh, Steve Howard. And Steve, he's the uh, MLA for Summerside South Drive and the critic for transportation, energy, and infrastructure, as well as justice and public safety. Um, but Steve is very passionate about energy. He, uh, before he got into politics, he was uh, in the renewable energy business as the uh, president of um, Renewable Lifestyles and Solar Island. So he, he's been had a long history with, uh, with renewable energy. And uh, he's bringing a lot of those skills to uh, the floor of the legislature. So before we get into, uh, before I pass it over to Steve, and he's going to talk about the bills that he's going to introduce to uh, modernize energy and electricity on PEI, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how the session today is going to flow. Uh, we're going to start with Steve obviously presenting his, uh, his bills. They're two bills, but they're very interrelated, so we'll talk about them both together. Then we'll open the floor to clarifying questions. So any questions that you have to basically understand what it is that, uh, that Steve is proposing in his legislation. And uh, then we will uh, open the floor to just general discussion. And uh, one of the reasons that Steve is here is that he would like to get your feedback on, uh, on what he's proposing, um, because that's, that's the consultation phase of this legislation and your feedback can help to improve the bill and make it, uh, make it work better. So um, I'll also let you know that uh, if you uh, would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment, there's a couple things you can do. One is uh, raise your hands uh, using the raise hand feature on Zoom. If you're not familiar with that, if you find the reactions that, you know, feature on your toolbar, which is usually next to where you'll find like the chat button, uh, under reactions, there's the option there to raise your hand. And that will make it easier. Um, I'll see that you're, you've got your hand raised and make sure that you uh, get called upon to uh, ask your question or make your comment. And um, you can also ask your questions in the chat. If you prefer not to talk, but you just want to write your questions in there, um, then just, uh, you know, and I see a few people are, are using the chat right now. So hopefully that's lit up bright orange for you if you're not already in it. And uh, uh, if you ask your questions in there, then I'll, I'll get to those questions as well. And you can also put uh, comments anytime in this chat, because at the end of the uh, session, I'll be able to download the chat history and uh, send it over to Steve so that he has a complete record of everything that anybody wanted to say. So even if it's just a thought, you know, in relation to something else that somebody's saying, um, feel free to put it down. And, and also thanks very much to uh, Maria Rodriguez, who's with us today, and she has volunteered to serve as our uh, volunteer kind of live blogging note taker. So she'll try to capture the points that people are making um, verbally by typing that into the chat as well. So that will become part of our record. Um, so without any further ado, then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Steve Howard. And uh, Steve, will you please tell us a little bit about your, um, your bill and, uh, or your bills, your two bills? What are they? What are they gonna do? Yeah, so I mean, the uh, they are two bills. They're they're kind of intended to achieve a common goal, as you mentioned, Jordan. They're very intertwined: the Electric Power Act and the Renewable Energy Act. Um, so, how the how the idea for the 
amendments came about originally, uh, well, we have a backwards rate structure here on PEI that encourages people to use more energy by charging them less the more they use. So that's been a, something that's really kind of boggled my mind. We're one of the only jurisdictions uh, left in the world that does it in such a manner because it's, a, it's a, from a bygone era. It's, it's how things were done 30, 50 years ago, uh, but we have yet to change it here. So that's where it kind of started. And then after having conversations with various academics and people in the field, um, it came to my attention that the minimum purchase price for renewable energy was an issue here on Prince Edward Island. It was a problem holding us back. And my initial reaction to the person who presented that to me, a professor at university, was, oh, well, how could that be? That's going to encourage renewable energy if we have uh, a good cost for, for wind power and solar power here guaranteed. Surely that'll attract people to, that'll want to install these systems on PEI for us. And sure enough, though, when you, and he was right, he uh, when you dig into it, the only people benefiting from that minimum purchase price, the only business, the only corporation is the PEI Energy Corporation. There's one other private wind farm here on PEI for 100 megawatts of wind. Summerside gets a little bit of that power, uh, leases it. The rest of it gets shipped off to NB Power for a lot less than Islanders pay for the power that we get from the wind turbines the PEI Energy Corporation owns. So what that revealed was that the PEI Energy Corporation is taking general revenue from ratepayers instead of taxpayers. Um, so ratepayers include everyone, everyone from people that can't afford their food and can't afford their medicine uh, to people that have so much that they have, uh, you know, five electric vehicles and a giant mansion that they heat with electricity and, and everybody was kind of paying the same. There, there's no progressive nature. You can't discriminate through the rate structure, but you can discriminate against, well not against, comparable to, from low income to high income earners. Those who can pay can pay and those who can't pay, well, you don't take from them. So what we've got is a structure in place that takes, that the, the Minister of Energy sets the price for the, the renewable energy. The Minister of Energy takes taxpayer dollars and, and funds uh, renewable energy systems that go in place. And, and now the Minister of Energy is also the Minister of Environment who decides whether those things get approval to go ahead or not. So we've got quite the conflict of interest intertwined in everything that's going on there. And what we're really after is massive public buy-in uh, behind a huge transition to renewable energy for Prince Edward Island. And that's simply not gonna happen if the more renewables that go out there, the higher the bills that people receive become. So that's really at the heart of everything here is to get people involved in the transition, get them excited about getting more renewables out on Prince Edward Island and see those benefits flow to the average Islander instead of into the general revenue coffers of government. Oh, I don't hear you, Jordan. Sorry, I had muted myself. So thank you, uh, thank you very much for that, Steve. Uh, so can you tell us um, specifically, so you have two bills, uh, what are these bills called and, and can you go over each one and basically what the intended outcome of each of your, your amendments are? Yeah, so they're both amendments to existing acts. So one's an, an act to amend the Electric Power Act and one's an act to amend the Renewable Energy Act. Um, and an act to amend the Electric Power Act um, we have in the preamble to that act currently, it says that where energy efficiency and demand side management measures are cost effective to be used, they shall be used by the utility. And that doesn't have any effect whatsoever on the legislation itself, however. It, it implies the spirit and intent of the act. But after spending a week in the rate structure hearings in August 2019, and arguing the case uh, before Iraq as Maritime Electric sought to increase rates and put a certain rate structure in place. I went then and asked that the rate structures be brought up to date and be made to encourage energy efficiency by rewarding those who use less, who, who also cost the grid less. Like it is right in line with our cost of service regulation is what we have here on PEI. So Maritime Electric can make their returns on a certain rate class, let's in this example, residential rate payers, but they can't make more money than they're allowed to make. And they 
don't really make any less money. They, they've kind of kind of got a guaranteed return. It's called a maximum return, but as we saw recently, when they're not going to make their maximum return, things change so that they can make their maximum return. So in essence, we have a guaranteed return, but that's what it is. But they, they can't take more than they should from a rate class. It's based on the cost of delivering power to that, that particular rate class. So someone who uses less power is less of a burden on the grid and it costs less to deliver power to them. So in line with the, the nature of regulation here on Prince Edward Island, those who use less power should pay less for per unit because they're less of a burden on the grid itself. But, but we're backwards. So that's a large part of what the Electric Power Act seeks to solve. And one of the reasons why this hasn't changed over the years is that we have a lot of large, they didn't start out large, but a lot of agricultural users are in that rate class. And it started back when there was the, a lot of family farms in Prince Edward Island and they're, they used power very similar to how a home would use power. But now they use millions of kilowatt hours a month in some of these operations there. They're industrial, they're, they're not even close to residential. And those large users paying residential rates bring down, the, like they, they're paying very little for their power and they're using a lot. So it skews the rate class. And the problem was if you suddenly shift the business model on those large businesses, it creates rate shock and panic within the, that, that industry. So it's been held up as a reason to not change at all. So one of the other things that we propose is bringing in a transitional rate class for agriculture um, that uh, still allows things to carry on business as usual for three years. After those three years, that class is phased out and those at large agricultural users, medium agricultural users, small, they all find their place in the other rate classes over the three years, but it gives them the time to adjust that they've been asking for. So that gets that out of there. And then we, we forbid a declining rate structure where you pay less for the more power that you use because we all, that's very counterintuitive to encouraging energy efficiency. That is also going to affect people who maybe use a lot of electric heat in their homes and things like that. So we also bring in a optional rate class or um, that is time of use, or you could call it time of wind really on Prince Edward Island. So it's based on when the wind blows, the power is inexpensive because we have all these turbines up there that are generating power to use it here on PEI is what we want. We don't want to send it off PEI as yet. We want to provide for our own means. And then when we have extra, send it off. But the thing is, when we send it off Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick Power charges us one and a half cents for every kilowatt hour we send off. So it loses value as soon as it loses P, leaves PEI. And well, we, we want to align, align our demand, our, our consumption with when our, our wind turbines are blowing. So we want to have a rate structure in place that encourages people to use electricity when abundant low cost renewables are available on island. And that, conveniently lines up most of the time with when you really want your space heating, your cold windy nights, that's when you're generating all sorts of on island wind power and uh, your power would be cheap through those storms. There'd be times of course where that wouldn't be the case, but it gives an option to the large users right now who might be paying, who might end up suffering some rate shock themselves. Because in the end, no one's gonna pay more or less for their power overall in the rate class. It's just changing who is going to pay their fair share in this. So currently, large users don't pay their fair share. Uh, that's been demonstrated in uh, rate applications before Maritime Electric and Maritime Electric themselves have literature that, that acknowledge that. There's, if we were to simply just flip the rate structures around as I proposed back in 2019, uh, this legislation doesn't get that specific, but if we were to do that, it would benefit 80 to 90% of ratepayers residentially here on Prince Edward Island. They would all see a lowering of their bill. Uh, so it's really those, those top end users are really placing an extra burden on the low end users at the moment. And, and that's just backwards. Uh, then we have the renewal. Uh, maybe I'll stop there just for a moment. Is there, uh, there's a lot to cover here in, in these, these two little amendments that I have here, but uh, <laughs> it, should, should, yeah, we definitely. Stop? Should, so, should we stop with one act, Jordan, and, and then so move maybe, on? Maybe, maybe just to uh, just to just to recap uh, the basic changes that uh, that are part of the uh, electricity, the Electric Power Act, that would um, 
set uh, time of use rates. Would it, would it require time of use rates uh, to be set or does it specify what they have to be like? No, it, 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 the, the language that we're gonna probably end up switching to instead of time of use, which in the industry tends to indicate time of day pricing, mm -hmm. expensive power in the day and cheap at night is the usual example. Hawaii uh, is exactly the opposite, however, because about 50% of the island has solar installed. So through the day, they have all sorts of renewable energy on island and that's when power is cheap and it's at night mm. that, that they're in Hawaii that power is expensive. But that's not what we're after here. The wind is very intermittent and that's what we have lots of. Sun's sort of reliable, you know, when the sun's up and when the sun's down uh, every day. Um, but the wind is very unreliable. So our rates would be much more dynamic and it's gonna require some smart grid infrastructure, which Maritime Electric, according to their integrated system plan, they've released plans to do regardless. So we're gonna have that infrastructure rolling out. Now we need to make sure we have legislation that uh, calls for it to be used properly, essentially. Okay. So it's, it's, gonna, do, it's gonna do that. It's also going to um, reverse the situation we have right now where, where people get a discount on their electricity if they use more of it, if they pass a certain minimum block. And it's going to eliminate the uh, agricultural class of, of rates. Transition to uh, because, that's right. Yeah, transition that out, okay. Okay, can you um, uh, just tell us a little bit with regards to that bill, um, who, who are the, I guess, stakeholders that you think would be uh, would benefit the most from having that bill? And um, are there any stakeholders that you think would be unhappy about those kinds of changes taking place? Well, really it comes to that 90%, 10%. Those 10% of high energy users are going to see an increase in their bill when their the rate structure kind of flips around. Um, it's, the legislation's not prescriptive. It just forbids the declining rate. So you could end up with a flat rate structure where everybody play, pays the same rate per kilowatt hour straight across. But how we've seen it present that presented by folks who may not may or may not understand energy energy regulation and PEI is that well right now we've got a high high bracket and a low block of power and they kind of took it as we're just going to raise rates on everybody by getting rid of the declining block. But as I mentioned earlier, Maritime Electric's not simply not allowed to just take more from a rate class. So if they mm. raise this, they, they will have to lower this. So in a flat rate, you'd have an evening out like this. Uh, but what I would like to see, honestly, is, is something tiered so that you find your, the more, the more um, sections of the rate class or more tiers, more blocks that you have to progress your way down, uh, the more the price signaling works is what all of the research research shows. So mm -hmm. we had five or six blocks of power where if you only used 500 a month, you're going to pay very minimal amount for your kilowatt hours. And if you pay, if you use 500 to 1,000, another chunk and 500 to 1,500, another chunk up. Those send the kind of price signals to people that really affect consumer behavior and get them thinking about using less. Mm -hmm. um, some people simply can't use less. And that's a, that is a fair point. Uh, for some to make, uh, but overall, it, it just simply will not have an increasing effect. It cannot have an increasing effect on the overall cost to the rate class to, to residential islanders. So yeah. I hope I would hope that moving forward, um, you're going to see uh, a rate class that that does have that inclining rate structure to it. And if it's something like what I proposed back in 2019 during those rate hearings. As I mentioned, uh, you can extrapolate it from the data that Maritime Electric was using to argue its case for uh, increasing rates. So I took that data and within it, it demonstrates that clearly more than 80% of residential ratepayers would pay less for their power and that top tier would pay more for their power. So those okay. are the, the stakeholders really in, in the major change in this legislation. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And, and there are uh, lots of great questions and, uh, and comments also rolling into the chat. Um, so just before we uh, go into sort of a recap of what the uh, Renewable Energy Act amendments will do, I want to get some of those questions answered. Uh, so first of all, uh, David was asking, you know, if New Brunswick charges us, you mentioned they charge us one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. 
when we send electricity to them? Why are we sending electricity to New Brunswick? Because we'd have no choice in that situation. It's, it's either stop the wind turbine from uh, producing called curtailment or send the power somewhere. Um, so in many places, when you have an overcapacity of wind, they will simply curtail the wind. They'll turn the wind turbines off and make no power. There's other situations where the cost of power can go negative such that if you feed power onto the grid, you have to pay. So it's to avoid those kinds of situations. New Brunswick Power has been offering since the beginning of Prince Edward Island putting up its first wind farm, balancing fe low features on the grid for free, no charge, uh, mm. which has been a huge benefit to Prince Edward Island. Thank you, NB Power. But now they realize that PEI is, you know, if we, if we go full in on wind, it's, it's, it's their ratepayers that end up having to pay for those, those fees. The, the, uh, they have to have peaker plants over there to operate, or they have to install enough storage to absorb that power because you can't have an unbalanced grid. If you put too much energy under the grid, the voltage will rise and you'll, you'll destroy some electronics and think things are rated to operate at our 240 volt AC or 120 volts. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put enough power out under the grid, the voltage will drop. And then you have higher current that happens, which heats up appliances. So over voltage, over current, it's essential to keep your, your grid in a balanced state. And that's what NB Power has been offering to PEI free of charge, but it's very much not free. Uh, mm. this, is, this is the problem that on-island storage can solve. Okay, so that maybe gets into uh, Amy's question. She's asking if, like, if we're currently producing um, excess wind energy, and I guess she's, she's asking, first of all, how much excess wind energy are we producing? And, uh, you know, if we're having to pay for it and, and it is excess, then why are we looking to install another 30 megawatts? Well, it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, I would say one of the reasons is that they're charging that minimum purchase price. The, uh, the minimum purchase price as it is was set back in 2004. And since then, the cost of wind power farms has gone down about 80%. The mm -hmm. price has stayed exactly the same. So originally it was intended to make sure that the province doesn't lose their shirt whenever they, or anybody doesn't lose their shirt when they install a wind farm, American Electric has to buy it and they can't say, we'll only give you two cents for it. It has to be seven and three quarter cents is where it starts according to this minimum purchase price. Uh, Alberta just awarded a wind contract last year or so and I, th I think it was 2.6 cents per kilowatt hour um, that they're paying for that, that modern wind farm that got installed. So since the, the price was installed, the, the, uh, the profit margin went up drastically for the PEI Energy Corporation. Mm -hmm. so, so compared to a wind, turbine, wind farm installed five years ago uh, that had no balancing fee associated with it, no one and a half cent fee, you now have something that costs less to install, but you have the one and a half cent fee. So the finances still make all sorts of sense for PEI Energy Corporation to go ahead and put that 30 megawatts in to continue to make money off of the back of rates pay, rate payers. However, uh, I would very much point out that we still have 100 megawatts of wind sitting on West Cape that Maritime Electric refuses to buy power from, even though they would offer that power gladly at the minimum purchase price and absorb the one and a half cent fee, um, but they won't even go to the table and speak to them. So obviously wow. we, we need a bit of a stick to encourage that. That's interesting. Okay, so we've, we've got uh, a couple more uh, people who want to ask questions. Uh, Rita, uh, you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yes, uh, thank you. I have a question about the agricultural producers. Now, they have been given a good deal because they do have to use a lot of electricity. But I, I want to know if you have consulted with the National Farmers Union and with the uh, supply managed producers. I believe that if their costs go up, they can raise the prices. So for example, milk, eggs, and poultry are all supply managed. So if their cost of production goes up, they can increase the cost of, for example, milk, eggs and chicken. Now, have you talked to them? Is that the case? Because we don't want to um, destroy farmers that are producing milk and chicken and eggs 
because we need it. <laughs> Long a absolutely, we do. Absolutely, we do. And, and yes, is the answer. I have not talked to chicken and egg producers. I, I'll admit that. But I have spoken with the Farmers Union. I have spoken with the Federation of Agriculture. And I have spoken with the Dairy Farmers Association. I spoke, sat down with a particular dairy farmer that shared his uh, energy usage and uh, how, how his farm runs with me. And we figured out what flipping around rates might do to his farm, for instance. And it, it added the cost of production to, yes, it did add cost to him. It was 10 cents per kilogram of uh, quota, kilogram of butter fat uh, quota that they have. Uh, so instead of making about $5 profit on a kilogram, he was going to make $4.90 kind of, kind of thing. And my, my reaction initially, uh, that gets worse the larger the farm is. Uh, it does get worse. So that was a 70 um, cow farm, I do believe, heard. Uh, but my reaction was, oh, well, that's not too bad. And he immediately said, well, I mean, that's, it doesn't sound like much, but when you multiply that by every day, I'm getting that much less. And I said, oh, that, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, what we're, it's an easy problem to mitigate with other measures, whether it's getting you some energy efficient equipment or getting you some renewable generation equipment on your farm. Uh, we have two problems we have to solve. We have to transition our island and we have to make sure our farms are protected. So in the dying hours of the legislature uh, last time round, I put forward a motion to make sure that we bring for forward incentives that uh, allow farms to transition to those kinds of things because it's two problems at once. Uh, it deals with that. And we already know that we need to do a lot more on the transition side of things. So let's invest in farmers. Let's give them a new revenue stream and let's let them lead the way on that part of the transition uh, while doing all sorts of other things as well. But uh, the bottom line is the farms that really use a lot of power, they, they're not these dairy farms uh, or possibly the largest dairy farm, but millions of kilowatt hours a month in the residential class. So it's, uh, we're not talking family farms there. Mm. Okay, thank you uh, for that great question, Rita. I'm gonna go to Roger, you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hi, hi, Steve. Hey, Roger. Um, just a, we're on to, a, as you know, a very complex subject in terms of uh, rate classes and electricity distribution. I just want to make one one thing clear that I, I would not like listeners to go away with, that the bottom line of our current wind energy, including the North Cape wind farms, we actually only export 1% of that wind energy every year. So out of about 600 megawatts of uh, megawatt hours of energy, we only actually export 1%. So I don't want to leave the impression, and it, it, it's a complicated issue in terms of contractual requirements between Maritime Electric and, and the PEI Energy Corp, but very, very little of our existing wind energy actually gets to the mainland. And more importantly, there is lots of room for another 30 megawatt wind farm and, and another 40 megawatt wind farm before we actually start to spill energy. So I think it's... It's this, if you understand it completely, then uh, we must make sure that red folks on the island aren't assuming that we're exp exporting a lot of wind energy because we're simply not. Well, Roger, the, there is the West Cape wind farm that exports about 90% of its 100 megawatts. Uh, it's, we just simply, they can't sell it here in Prince Edward Island. I was just, no, no, just speaking the, with them last week. Yeah, bottom, well, bottom line is, Steve, is that as you know, we either import energy from the mainland or we export wind energy. But there is a net value of that. If you look at the transfer of energy of what we don't import from New Brunswick Power, they're still get, getting paid for the wind energy. But in terms of how much wind energy we're using on the island, we're using close to 50% of our consumption in the same way that Summerside Electric used close to 50%. So the match between our energy demands and the amount of wind energy we're generating is pretty good right now. So we haven't got to the point that we're actually exporting wind energy. And to answer the question, one question of the same, why are we contemplating building another 30 mega wind farm? Because in fact, we can consume that energy. We don't export it. 
uh, the PEI Energy Corporation themselves argue argue the other way. I, I mean, Roger, I'll, I'll take you at your word on that. Maybe you can send me some information on it after, but the, the West Cape Wind Farm themselves, financially in any case, perhaps not in the flow of, of, of electricity, exports most of 100 megawatts of wind power. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, and, and the difference is that they get paid for that wind energy, for sure, but it doesn't actually leave the island. So all, when Maritime Electric report 25% of our energy is, is, is wind, that is because that's the contract with MB Power. But in fact, just this notion of, are we over-generating renewable energy? We are not at the moment. We can consume, we actually, if Maritime Electric, to your point, if Maritime Electric was to buy the energy from North Cape, West they Cape. could, West Cape, they could, they could, uh, they could um, consume that. That that was the ideal. Um, no, no, they are. I mean, the, 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 one, it's fantastic, Roger. I look I look forward to the info because one of the arguments uh, against getting rid of the minimum purchase price is that the poor PEI Energy Corporation is going to have to pay these balancing fees for every single wind farm moving forward to NB Power. So uh, they they make that argument themselves. So it's it's not something well, come from me, and I'd love to have the information that shows uh, that people. Yeah, not not to prolong it, Steve, but it's true. Every additional megawatt of wind energy will have will incur a balancing charge. That is very true. And mm -hmm. that is in fact increasing with MB power. But the, just to leave to leave some of the listeners with, oh, we're we're exporting wind energy and we're going to build building more, that's just not the right concept. So but I can I can bring your attention to where I get that data from. Very good. Yeah, I, I think that there's a difference that people would perceive in, in where the benefit lies. We're exporting benefits, perhaps, uh, from our West Cape or West Point wind farm, uh, whereas the the actual electrons, yes, they would stay on Prince Edward Island and get consumed here. So, well, I guess from, an, from an engineering perspective, which I, I know is where your mind would be looking at this, Roger, right. yeah. absolutely. But uh, just uh, the final point I make, Steve, is that you've talked about with Maritime Electric about um, uh, the base cost of energy that we import from the mainland. And in fact, right now, that is higher than the uh, guaranteed price for wind energy. So even if we were to um, drop the price of wind energy, we would still be paying uh, over eight, nine cents a kilowatt hour for energy that we import from New Brunswick power. So there isn't, there really isn't a cost advantage in terms of releasing that minimum price of wind energy because we're already paying more for more for fossil-based energy than we are for wind energy. So it's a good story, really. <laughs> what I you, you, did you say? There's no advantage to islanders to releasing the minimum purchase price. No. On wind? Yeah, there is not because if it's replaced with imported energy, then no, islanders. No, it's, islanders it's, repla will it's be replaced paying. with it's replaced with new lower cost wind energy. And where would they get that lower cost energy from? Well, they could get a lot of it from West Point today and the new 30 megawatt farm that's going up. Well, if that's not uh, tied to the minimum purchase price and there was an open competitive market where Maritime Electric could say, we're going to take the lowest cost, not the forced to pay that's seven and three quarter cents. It's definitely going to deliver lower yeah. cost power to PEI. Yeah, well, you, you may have the information of, of what West Cape actually export to MB Power for. I, I don't know what that is. I'm assuming Sig it's significantly less than the minimum purchase price. Point, point taken, point taken, yeah. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that, Roger. I'm gonna go next to a question from David. Oh, you can uh, unmute yourself, David. <clears throat> yes, I'm curious. Um, aren't um, Maritime Electric and uh, the other uh, corporation that we're talking about, the energy corporation, aren't they regulated uh, utilities? Doesn't uh, the yes. provincial government make the rules, the regulations? Well, they set the, are we talking about electric rate structures themselves well, here, David? I'm, well, I'm talking in about general. is that Maritime Electric, you said, I, or I understood, is refusing to buy from the North Cape. Mm-hmm. Well, can't the, the, the they're allowed to refuse it. Tell them, can't, 
Well, yes, you can't could. refuse. You have to do it. It's, we're yes, regulating they, you. Yes, you could. You could do so. And in in fact, if as Roger indicated, the cost of that wind is less than the cost of what we're importing from NB Power. It is their obligation to provide low cost power. I just had a meeting with Maritime Electric Monday, and that is, if we can access lower cost power, we will access that, Steve. Um, so, if indeed there's lower cost power sitting there, and the, the West Cape Wind Farm or West Point Wind Farm has power, that they could they're, they're they're about to enter into a new five year contract with NB Power starting this fall, and yet nobody on PEI will talk to them other than the City of Summerside. And they're selling it for pennies off island NB power. So ratepayers and NB power, uh, it's probably going off off island NB power, and then they're selling it back through uh, nine or ten cents to us, as Roger indicated. So they're selling us our own power back, uh, not our own power. Uh, NG that owns West Capes, West Point yeah. Wind Farm. So does the provincial government have the ability to say we won't accept this deal? You have to sell us. Oh, what yes. I mean, a majority government and legislature could pass any sort of uh, powers. They, they, they have pretty much absolute power on Prince Edward Island within the rails of that legislature with a majority mm -hmm. government. The answer is yes to almost everything. They could pass a law that, yes, absolutely. And so, uh, un under our current regulation, even, David, that yes is the answer. They're supposed to be delivering it at low cost power to islanders as they can. So why would the majority government not want mm. us to? Oh, it's, 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 it's a good question, David. Let's uh, look we, at who, who has shares in uh, these companies. <laughs> well, the PEI Energy Corporation that uh, benefits greatly from the minimum purchase price um, does not want to see competition. If the private industry was allowed in to compete with the PEI Energy Corporation in a fair market, uh, they would have to make an awful lot less money is just a truth. Mm -hmm. Whether that's the reason or not, I couldn't tell you, but that is a truth. And the sole beneficiary of the minimum purchase price on Prince Edward Island is the PEI Energy Corp, who the Minister of Energy sits on the board of and is the person responsible for setting that regulation. So they set the price that only they can access. Uh, personally, I see a huge conflict of interest there. And, yeah. and, and we have a 100 megawatt wind farm that was put up many years ago. So that would have been hundreds of millions of dollars of stranded capital from private investment. If we want to make a massive transition here on PEI, 30 megawatts at a time is nice, but they did 100 megawatts at a time. And they would have done more if the financials made sense. Mm. So why not attract more private investment by opening up the market? and exposing Islanders to the true 80% decline since 2000 and, well, actually that's only in the last 10 years uh, in wind power that Islanders are sheltered from by this minimum purchase price. The way, the way I see the minimum purchase price is a reverse carbon tax. It's artificially inflating the cost of clean energy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for that, David. I'm gonna go to a couple other questions. Um, we've got uh, Omer and then Matt and uh and barbara and then i'm going to ask you to quickly tell us about the renewable energy act amendment which is kind of a simpler concept but it's also it's a very important amendment that you're looking to make with some some really uh, hefty targets and uh, then we can get into some discussion about that as well, well first we of all, oh, oh sorry uh were, were you going to say something steve no, nope, I thought you just wanted me to carry on to the Renewable Energy Act there. You keep going, Jordan. I'm going to, I'm going to take, take a couple of questions that are coming in right now here. So uh, first of all, Omer. I'm going to make this quick. So the concept of renewable energy really fascinates me. But what fascinates me more is the concept of being self-reliant and talking about off-grid systems rather than grid tie systems. Um, why aren't we having more of a conversation on uh, DIY uh, off-grid systems uh, so that we can bring solar and renewable energy in the hands of more people. So I'm sorry, it was, why aren't we encouraging more off-grid is, is really the crux of the question. Exactly, okay. more DIY, more off-grid systems 
um, so that we can reduce the cost so that we can give renewable energy in the hands of more people. Well, I mean, the, I see Matt McCarville's on the line here right now. And, and uh, Matt introduced me to some wonderful research that was done by Mark Jacobson. And I suppose at the, at the bottom line, it's, it's that it's much easier, like the wind's blowing somewhere. Uh, by times and sharing power and sharing energy resources is much less expensive and, and easier to transition than it is to have a whole bunch of off-grid systems set up. If, if there was a neighborhood battery system, that's, that's an awful lot less expensive than putting in a battery system in each home and setting up with enough storage in that home to get it through a winter and things like this. So I, I suppose it comes to a systemic question of why not encourage off-grid? Although I will tell you that I sat in Maritime Electric's boardroom years ago and said, what are you gonna do when uh, power is already less expensive from solar panels, it's reached grid parity. What are you gonna do when storage does the same and everybody just simply wants to cut the line with Maritime Electric? Um, so yep. it, it's, it's definitely something we, I've had conversations with a lot over the years. I've designed a fair amount of off-grid systems myself though, and. I, I can tell you that the costs go through the roof whenever you don't have access to that shared infrastructure. So if we want to get things going quickly and make a large transition, it's through that existing large grid infrastructure that, that the real opportunity lies. Right, right. And my thought process is also, you know how we grow our own food and we don't rely on anybody else? The same concept, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited about growing my own power uh, rather than trying to rely on somebody else. So God forbid if the grid fails or, or something happens, for example, or like you said, if lithium batteries become way cheaper in the future, then you know we, we need to start having this conversation now just to kind of encourage people to, to get into it. Well, I'll tell you, local resiliency is probably the main driver. There's many reasons for me pressing forward with this, but local resiliency, it, uh, PEI is not an oil exporter. PEI doesn't have any of those resources, but what we have is wind and we have sun. Uh, we also have water, sure. but uh, that, that's not really a benefit to us as yet. Uh, there might be a hydrogen economy start up that where suddenly access to all that water is going to be a wonderful thing, but we're not even close to that yet. But what we do have is lots of sun and wind. So local resiliency. If we want to be locally resilient, we have to rely on what we find within Prince Edward Island. Um, so th that's that's the heart and soul driving this for me. There's also the there's the climate uh, aspect of things for sure. There's also the economic aspect of things. Uh, whenever we are uh, not sending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars off island to resources that lie elsewhere, we're we're economically more resilient as well. So if, if we have a superstorm blast through here and we have a whole bunch of distributed generation and storage and electric vehicles and things like this, we're going to be far better off than if we have in the old days. Uh, I mean, Summerside Utility back in the day is a fantastic example of what I was going to talk about with resiliency. The reason we have Maritime Electric is because a big storm swept through, uh, knocked down a bunch of lines on Summerside Electric that used to serve far beyond its borders uh, as it stands now. And they sold that to the Maritime Electric for $1. Uh, and then government gave Maritime Electric a bunch of money to fix everything. Uh, so to avoid those kind of situations where you just look at something and you say, that's not even worth fixing. I, it's so, that, that's, what, what a terrible mess. We need to become far more resilient as, as an energy structure here on Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you and very much last, for that, Omer. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to, um, because uh, our time is uh, passing us by quickly, I'm going to um, go over to uh, Matt McCarville. And if you just want to make sure you're off mute, Matt. Are you able to hear oh, me? We can hear you there now, you yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I've expressed some concerns um, to Steve. And I don't know uh, how to wrap my head around them. Uh, when I think about some of the changes that we're looking to do, um, I think uh, there could actually be some pretty huge barriers uh, that still get left unresolved. Uh, and, uh, and I've expressed some of those to Steve. I won't get into it too much. Uh, I know that people like Roger might have some insights that uh, uh, could be relevant. And so like uh, one of the things with uh, 
trying to make this transition to clean renewable energy and storage, a more efficient uh, energy system, uh, uh, electrifying heating and transportation. Uh, we're, we're really um, uh, gonna have to encourage the demand side flexibility, the uh, uh, demand response, energy efficiency. When we put that language in to encourage efficiency, to encourage demand response, usually that's with a view to reducing overall electricity demand or holding it flat or even reducing it. Whereas we're also trying to increase uh, electricity use because that's really how we're going to be able to make use of these clean renewables uh, that are low cost uh, to um, uh, uh, generate uh, from wind and, and solar. And so um, that, that's uh, an issue. And, and I wanna hone in on demand charge for a second and say that demand charges as they are today, in my view, I think uh, all the research I've done on this is that uh, they really can inhibit it, um, the, this transition, if we're not careful, because uh, especially when they're like a flat, a flat demand charge uh, that happens each billing period. It's, it's, non, it's, it's not, it's a peak, what they call a peak demand charge. So if you are a customer, let's say you're a general service or a small industrial customer, after 20 kilowatts of, of power use, if you use 21, then uh, go to 21 kilowatt instead of 20, you'll pay an extra $13 or so, a little more than $13 for that extra kilowatt of power that you draw, even if you just draw it for an hour uh, over a course of a billing period. Now imagine you're trying to install as a, uh, one of these customers, uh, a, 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 a seven kilowatt uh, charger uh, for an electric vehicle. Well, you could end up paying a demand charge over $1,100 just to be able to try to preferentially charge on wind and solar. Um, if you instead do what everyone does today, they're, they're spending a bunch of money to reduce peak demand that has nothing to do with the overall system-wide peak. They're trying to reduce their own peak um, and it's blind to the objectives of the overall system-wide uh, condition. And so that's the problem is people are making, they'll, they'll spend money and buy batteries find, and, and they'll justify that cost because it's avoiding a, a peak demand charge that has nothing to do. And so they're operating behind the meter in a way that has nothing to do with whether the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. They're just trying to, to avoid a demand charge. And, and so what that's gonna mean is um, if the regulatory framework is reactive and, and, and trying to sort of address issues after the fact, they're never gonna get to an issue where, you know, oh, we've got a bunch of electrification because that's not ever gonna happen. Uh, so that's a, a thought, I wanna put it out there. And there are approaches to work around it where, where the regulators sort of have a, a um, um, an approach where they're sort of a future-based approach rather than a reactive approach where um, you sort of get rid of that demand charge and you've still got to cover the distribution and transmission costs um, in, the, you know, in, in, in your market design or your rate design. But I, but I, th I see that as a, a major barrier in terms of, in terms of uh, trying to, uh, you know, electrify heating and transportation and, and, and get the wind and solar online. The other thing I'll just point out quickly is uh, the minimum power purchase agreement. Um, one thing that ultimately would, at the end of the day, if you've got declining costs for wind, declining costs for solar, and you're trying to have competitive markets, the uh, people who are building, they're still gonna need to have a low risk environment. So whatever their costs are, uh, 
you know, as long as they're being prudent enough, they're going to have to get a cost recovery and some sort of rate of return. It might be less than eight cents a kilowatt hour, but it's got to be something that'll still get insurance assurance that we're going to get new projects built. So we're still going to need maybe like in Quebec, they're moving forward with contracts right now based on 30 year uh, agreement for wind. And, and so I think that that uh, stability is what's going to, you know, even though you can have dynamic pricing, at the end of the day, there's got to be some sort of a settling done so that we ensure that they're recovering a, a fair rate of return. Maybe it's less than 8%, like for 9% that the utility always gets, but maybe it's something like 4 or 5%. Anyway, that's it. Thank you uh, very much, Matt. And so I'll, I'll ask Steve if you want to um, respond to, to some of those uh, ideas that Matt just presented. But this might also be a good time, since we, we have less than 10 minutes left on the clock really here, to, to talk about the targets uh, that you're laying out in the Renewable Energy Act uh, amendment, so that we can get that on the table here as well, in case anybody wants to um, bring anything up about that. Thing. I, I mean, I, I'll address Matt, Matt's concerns there as well. Uh, so one of the things that the legislation does propose is bringing in a, a rate structure based upon uh, the availability of on-island renewables. And through our existing regulation, uh, the utility, as I've mentioned earlier in this um, presentation, I suppose, uh, they just simply can't just make more money. Uh, if there's more demand there, um, and they're raking in extra dollars, uh, then the regulator, if they're doing their job, will come in and say, you can't charge that much for each unit of demand. They'll say, you can't charge that much for each unit of energy. What that rate structure ends up looking like exactly is not prescript prescribed within my legislation, but that is exactly what it's after, is a rate structure that encourages on-island consumption when on-island on -island renewables are available. So I would hope through a strong regulator that that, that, that concern of yours is addressed there, Matt. Uh, and the other thing I'd add to your second point of getting rid of the minimum purchase price and having to have a rate of return for any developer, uh, absolutely, but that'll be up to the developer to determine and they'll sign a 20 year or 30 year or 10 year, whatever that contract might be that they find satisfactory, they're gonna sign that power purchase agreement and it's gonna probably come through a competitive process. So. Uh, everybody kind of wins on, on PEI in that regard. We get a bunch more clean energy, perhaps from private development, perhaps from our PEI Energy Corp, but it's going to be through a competitive process that delivers the extra value to islanders and gives the return to whatever entity it is that installs that wind farm. So it's certainly not talking about eliminating profits and, and keeping people out. It, it, the intention is exactly the opposite, to attract people here through, through that stability that you mentioned. And as Jordan mentioned, there's another part to this that's uh, rather major. So if we get rid of the minimum purchase price, that does not mean that Maritime Electric will sign a contract with any particular wind developer. Um, I mean, as we I've described earlier, there's a, there's a West Cape wind farm that's selling a lot of its power off PEI because they cannot get the utility here to purchase it. So how do we encourage them to go ahead and say, yes, we'd like to keep that on island generation here that's through a renewable portfolio standard, which is something we used to have here in our legislation, calling for at least 15% in the old original 2004 version of this act, 15% renewables. Uh, and the utility had to provide reporting showing how they were attaining that. So 15% we passed a long time ago here on PEI. And so we've got new targets in here. And uh, if I'm being honest, when I first drafted this, the targets I had were far less aggressive than they are in the existing legislation. We adjusted this legislation to align with government's announced targets of 2030 net zero energy and 2040 net zero for all of Prince Edward Island. Um, and we have since those announcements were made, legislation from Lynn Lund passed in the legislature who, I mean, Lynn adjusted her legislation as well for these very aggressive targets. So now enshrined in legislation that we have, that we are going to achieve these goals and there's going to be an annual report of how we're going to achieve these goals. So, but if there's going to be anything that creates upwards pressure on pricing here on Prince Edward Island, it's going to be those aggressive targets of how fast we have to do this transition. And uh, I'm not against doing it quickly, but we have to be very careful that we don't just simply slide into um, a free-for-all of having to accept contracts because we have to achieve these targets. 
um, we have to protect the ratepayers as well as achieve our, our targets and our goals of transitioning. So uh, that's that's a very complex part of this, but uh, it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a big task. Okay, thank you, Steve. And so uh, just to specify there, the the targets that you set are 100% renewable by 2030 and 50% by 2025. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And we're about, uh, oh, I think it's about 40% now. Um, don't quote me on that number. Uh, but we're, we're quite a ways towards 50% now. In any case, we mm -hmm. don't have a whole lot more work to do in that regard. That's, that's a very attainable goal. However, the 100% goal by 2030, the, the, the last 10 percent or so, the, the, the last part of this transition is going to be the most difficult. Uh, so it's quite possible that we'll get to 90% and find that it's just not economically feasible to do that last 10%. But, you know, that's, that's leaps and bounds ahead of where we are today. And if we don't shoot for the target, then we will fall far, far short of it, I think. So. Mm -hmm. And would you say the, the number one sort of uh, challenge there to achieving that target will be solving the storage problem? Uh, that's, because I know yes. that's, yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, so the other thing that these, these changes accomplish, uh, if we have dynamic pricing, meaning prices are higher at certain times of day when the wind's blowing, let's, let's just use for an example, if that's where we end up, the wind blows, power is cheap. Well, suddenly it makes an awful lot of sense to have a smart charger installed for your electric vehicle, uh, which is a form of storage. It, it makes an awful lot of sense to do what Summerside's doing here and have, I, I've got a big hundred and some gallon hot water heater in my basement that when the wind turbines blow in Summerside here, uh, it's programmed to take that energy when it's available instead of Summerside being forced to sell it off into the market for an awful lot less than they'd sell it to me. Uh, so it works for Summerside, it works for me and it, and it benefits the grid and contributes to that overall grid stability. So all those kinds of things, whether it's thermal storage, whether it's electric vehicle storage, whether it's home storage, uh, we need, whether it's neighborhood storage, whether it's grid scale storage, PEI needs all sorts of storage. And what a rate structure does that if you had a battery in your basement, let's say, you could charge it up at night when power is cheap or when the wind's not blowing when power is cheap. And then one of the other things this legislation does is include storage in the net metering rules, which means you can send power out to the grid. Uh, you'd have to follow all sorts of regulation and things like that in order to be able to do so to protect your alignment, et cetera. But um, you could buy cheap and sell expensive. So it suddenly it creates a revenue stream from home storage or perhaps from your electric vehicle. Um, but those kinds of things are encouraged with changes as proposed here. Okay, thank you, Steve. And since we're, we're almost at eight and, and I know there's uh, more questions that have been posted in the chat, um, I just want to check, Steve, are, are you able to stay for another 10 minutes or so just to uh, answer some more questions? I'm good, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go to Luciano here. I know he's been waiting for a little while to uh, ask a question. Luciano, do you want to go ahead? Uh, are you able to hear me? Because I'm yes, on a cell can. phone. You can hear you. Uh, a question for you, uh, Steve. Uh, I've read the, the proposed uh, changes to the two acts. Uh, kudos for time of use, kudos for storage, absolutely. I am not 100% sure that what you are trying to accomplish with the reduction of the minimum purchase price will accomplish what you are hoping to accomplish, and I'll explain why. So maybe first I should ask the question, do you hope to reduce rates or to incorporate more renewables or both? Because unfortunately, the way um, power is structured in PEI, reducing how much maritime electric pays for renewable will not bring the power rates down. And I'll explain why. But uh, the question is, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with that one item? Well, it is to reduce rates overall. It's, it's to expose ratepayers to the low cost of renewables that exist today. So I, I'm not really sure how you are going to have to explain to me what you mean by if, yes. if Maritime well, Electric the way, pays, pays yeah. less for their power, uh, they, they won't lower rates. Yeah. 
Exactly. Uh, you remember not too long ago, they were buying the same power that they're paying, uh, uh, MB Power now, from what I hear from Roger, as high as nine cents. Not too long ago, they were buying, uh, you know, they have a long term contract with Dalhousie. They get the nuclear 50 megawatts out of that. And for that, they pay very low rate, two, three cents a kilowatt hour. But yeah, not too long ago, they were only paying uh, five cents, five and a half cents. But they're also paying for ancillary services. As you mentioned earlier, they actually provide PEI with um, ancillary services, frequency, voltage, uh, uh, they do load following, all the things that Nova Scotia Power needs without firing their LN6000, which they have in Charlottetown. Otherwise, they would have to do it themselves. But basically, the way their rate is structured is anything they purchase in terms of electricity, whether they buy it from the PI Corp or from MB Power, for them is treated as if it was fuel. It's a pass through. They pay a cent, they put in their budget a cent. They pay nine cents, they put nine cents. It's a pass through. But the biggest portion of their uh, uh, cost is maintenance and overhead. Big, big chunk. And then, of course, this profit, 9.5% over their capital investment. That doesn't change. How much they pay for electricity doesn't change that. Whatever they have invested, 9.5% every year until the amortization is complete. And whatever they spend every year on operating and maintenance and overhead, that doesn't change. That stays in the rate. So let's assume that they were paying less for the electricity, you would not see the current rates go down in any manner that island rate payers would notice. You would, not, you would see a small marginal reduction. But if you want to reduce the power for uh, island rate payers, there are ways and you have to change the structure of how electricity is produced and delivered in PEI. And basically, you take an example from what happened in New England, where the governors of New England, way, way back, they told the utilities, you can produce energy or you can distribute it, but you can't do both. It's one or the other. If you want to distribute it, great, then you have to buy in the open market. And if you have a target of net zero, then buy from renewables. But otherwise, you can't be both. And the problem with the rates in PEI is that Maritime Electric is both. It's both a producer, although they don't produce very much, they buy, and they are a distributor. So that would be my suggestion as to one structural change that can help. The other thing is that if you want to incorporate more renewables, push the government to open it up to more and more producers. Why aren't farmers producing and inputting into the grid at a decent price? If they need to be competitive, choose a feed-in tariff that makes it interesting for the rate payers, but pays them back. Why aren't more small businesses able to do that? Why isn't there more open access to the production side of renewables? It makes no sense that a government agency, which Traditionally, something everybody frowns upon, oh my God, a government agency is actually running a business. Um, why is that the only player in this, uh, in this electricity generation system? Those are fundamental structural things that need to change if one wants to arrive long-term at energy self-sufficiency. And for PEI, 200, 240 megawatt of, uh, of high demand, it's a breeze. I mean, in some of the large jurisdictions in Boston, they would wake up in the morning, turn their coffee machines, and that's 250 megawatts. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a difficult uh, thing to accomplish. It's the will to do it and how to do it, the, the execution of how you do it. And PI can actually become net zero very, very um, quickly, you know, over a period of just a few years, but the structure of how it, it, it works has to change. And I, I think the other two items you are putting, the changes you're putting, absolutely. Uh, storage, you know, PI actually manufactured a uh, battery energy storage system right in Montague, a corner. They make some of the best uh, 
uh, units uh, that I've seen on the market, uh, better even than the Tesla, and uh, with very smart uh, optimization system, very smart technology, uh, much faster than any of the stuff that Tesla produces. So a good incentive for PEI. But uh, other than that, reducing the rate by itself is not going to do what you hope to accomplish, I don't think. Okay. Well, there's a bit to unpack in that, uh, that question there, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, the, the, there, there's certainly, I mean, you mentioned that uh, lowering the power rates doesn't mean Maritime Electric's not going to get their profits, and that's absolutely true. Selling more power yeah. doesn't make them more money. Selling less power doesn't make them more money. Having a certain amount of assets and generating returns based on that through the regulator approval does, but a part of that cost is the energy. A big part of that cost is roughly eight cents per kilowatt hour. The the blended cost of all the various sources that they get. So when you pay your 14 cents per kilowatt hour, eight cents of that is the cost of power. And if that cost of that power went down to four cents, then your bill, you wouldn't be paying 14 cents anymore. You'd be paying 10 cents and Maritime Electric still getting their same return. So I recognize that changing the minimum purchase price isn't gonna instantly change the price of power on Prince Edward Island for in a drastic manner. Uh, access to that 100 megawatts at West Cape or West Point uh, will have an impact. But moving forward, as we put in more and more of this wind farm and transition quickly, as you said, having access to three cent power instead of eight cent power is most definitely going to lower rates to to everybody, not not just uh, residential. It's it's going to rate across the board. Uh, and the the other thing I'd say is uh, you said why don't we encourage more producers? Well, that's exactly what getting rid of the minimum purchase price does. And the reason that we have a, a monopoly right now is because the PEI Energy Corporation and the Minister of Energy are sort of one and the same, and they make the rules. They set the minimum price, and they are the only ones with enough, enough firepower to force Maritime Electric to sign a power purchase agreement with them. Uh, they are the only player that has that ability. Maritime Electric, as demonstrated clearly by West Point, does not want to buy that power. They need to be forced. So Steve- uh, Can I uh, ask you? Huh. Sorry. Yeah, can, sure. Can I uh, ask just one yeah. more? <laughs> <laughs> Have you factored in when you say, if instead of paying eight cents for the energy, they were paying three cents, it would lower the rates. Have you factored what else it would cost them to balance that variable energy, because there's a big difference being able to buy renewable energy that's dispatchable and renewable energy that's variable. So I buy it at three cents, but I had to spend another five cents to balance it because the consumer wants cents. it. Even yeah, uh, the balancing fees are one and a half cents. Sorry. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, with the West Point wind farm, w when I asked them directly if you were being paid the minimum purchase price and you were forced to absorb the one and a half cents, um, would it still be preferable to what you're selling to NV Power for? I don't have any specific numbers for what they're selling within their power purchase agreement being negotiated with NV Power is, but that would be very attractive to the West Point wind farm. Um, so that indicates to me that they're selling it for considerably less than that. But that's exactly why we need to have more on-island storage is to avoid that moving forward, because that's gonna get more and more expensive. That's going to be more and more of the cost that, that Islanders have to pay. And the more we can keep it on PEI, the less that of a factor that is, which is why it's important to have time of wind pricing so that we use the power when it's available and it doesn't end up going off island. Um, so yes, it's definitely a factor. It's definitely something that's been considered within the legislation and uh, it, it, it's being held up as a reason for, to keep the minimum purchase price high by the PEI Energy Corporation. They're saying we don't make as much profit as you think because NV Power takes it through balancing fees, uh, but the books of PEI Energy Corp show quite a profit every year. So, and well, is there a for... way that? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Luciano. Uh, you know what? I, no, I and there's, there's I so many. No, no, the story. No worries. There's there's uh, there's so many great uh, people that yeah. are very knowledgeable, okay, obviously, uh, on this call. And and Steve's consultation doesn't doesn't end here. So I think I think what we should do is, um, you know, I, I'll I'll send a follow up to everybody that was on the call with how to get a hold of Steve, because there are some conversations that I think definitely need to continue. Um, but just because we we need to wrap up uh, very shortly, 
Uh, I just want to go to a couple of questions that were sort of related to this that have come up in the chat. Uh, one of them from Barbara earlier was asking about, uh, Steve, if you had the power, you know, if the Greens had a majority government, would you uh, end the PEI Energy Corporation's monopoly? And I guess, is that a, the, the, quest, the question that would tag onto that is, you know, is that a legislative monopoly or just a de facto monopoly? And can you also explain a little bit about what, what the PEI Energy Corporation is? Um, so sure, let's start with that. What is the PEI Energy Corporation? It's a crown corporation that has the Minister of Energy, the Deputy Minister of Energy sit on its board uh, along with, well, the CEO of the PEI Energy Corporation and a few other folks along the way as well. But it's a, a crown corporation, so all of its revenues, um, and this is held up as a reason like, why the minimum purchase price is a good thing. I questioned the minister about the minimum purchase price in legislature, and the answer he gave was, well, we we'll use that money for all sorts of services for islanders. And that's great, really is, but you're taking it from ratepayers. You have other sources of revenue. You are, you are the government. You should be taking it through a progressive tax system, not through a ratepayer system that takes from people who have nothing to give. So that's really the bottom line of why that is essential to change. Um, so so and the PI Energy Corporation is extremely well funded. Uh, they can, their borrowing rates are far below 2%. They can, they can borrow money off the books to put up these wind farms. So it doesn't end up being specifically taxpayer money, but it's sort of a taxpayer risk to take that money mm -hmm. and invest it into these wind farms, um, which then generate revenue for government which honestly, it sounds great. These wind turbines are generating revenue. It's the source of that revenue that's the problem. And the source of that revenue are people, includes, it's not all people that can't afford it, includes people non-discriminatorily taking from everybody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, imagine a tax system like that. Right. And is that is that a legislated monopoly that they have or is it just uh, something that's kind of emerged as a de facto monopoly? It is... The, the Renewable Energy Act within it says that the minister has the, 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 the legislation for minimum purchase price. And that says that the minister gets to set that in regulation. That was set back in 2004 by the minister at the time, and it's not changed since. Um, okay. It's something that should be revisited and, and reduced as the cost of installing a wind farm goes down. Um, that just makes sense. Any, anybody can understand how that would correlate with each other. If it costs half as much mm -hmm. as it used to, to install a wind farm, the minimum purchase price should probably be half what it used to be. Uh, but in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the role of the energy corporation itself, uh, is, does, does it have, because it's been referred to as a monopoly, does it actually have a monopoly uh, in a way that, that would need to be changed by legislation to open it up? It, to it does not producers? have a monopoly okay. per se. There's, there's no legislated monopoly. Okay. Uh, the PI Energy Corporation has recently become an actual utility itself. So, so all new generation assets moving forward, instead of Maritime Electric now buying a new generator, PI Energy Corporation, the government has first right of refusal on buying new generation assets. Mm -hmm. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is because they can borrow at less than 2%. Whereas if we get it through Maritime Electric, we pay their shareholders their 9% guaranteed returns. So we pay an awful lot more interest when we let Maritime Electric buy it, essentially, than when the PEI Energy Corporation buys it. Now, right. the, the other aspect that uh, PEI Energy Corporation has entered the monopoly that used to be Maritime Electric's is in regard to demand side management and energy efficiency programs. So they are now allowed to do things that encourage what this legislation is kind of seeking to achieve, shifting loads, sh shifting demand to align with um, our, our production. So when we have power available is when people want to use it. That, that's good for the grid. Uh, aligning consumption with production, that's that's what a grid operator wants to see. Uh, and that's what demand side management is. Energy efficiency is trying to encourage people to use less. So um, whether it's putting in energy efficient appliances or whether it's a rate structure that says you're going to pay less if you use less, just so that psychologically everybody is aware that using less is a reward. Great, thank you. And just uh, one more question here. Good question from Pauline before we say good night. Um, so she refers to the Community Sustainability Fund, which appears to be encouraging communities to become energy resilient. And she's wondering whether you have any thoughts about whether things like micro hydro, 
uh, could become a thing again. She points to a project in Bredalben, small hydro dam. I mean, hydro is wonderful. Um, I looked at buying a property myself that had a little pond on it and a dam, but the, the real bottom line on PEI is this, there's not much available. When we're talking about these transformative kind of large changes, hydro is not the solution for us here on PEI. Um, it's, it's good, don't get me wrong, um, but there's just simply not very much power available because the, the, the two ways that you make power with hydro is either fast flowing water or fire dropping water. And PEI has none of either of those. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but th there was more to that question with the Sustainable Communities Initiative that's there. Yes, of course, uh, yes. A absolutely, we, sh we uh, I, I would like to know more about that program. What's, what's the budget for that program? What, I questioned the minister in the house about this and said uh, it seems to be all energy related, yet uh, I, I haven't heard of anything. What's going on with it? And his answer was it has nothing to do with energy. I don't know where you got that idea. Well, if you go to the website, the very first thing is talks all about an energy transition. It talks about nothing else. Hmm. But uh, I, I have no idea how many applicants came in. I've, I've tried to get that information. Who's going to, uh, what kind of projects are in development? What kind of budget? What kind of help they can expect? I watched a webinar that the minister and his uh, his helpers put on there once, and the question was, can I put up a greenhouse? Would that qualify for your program? And yes, was the answer right away. Um, I have no idea what that program is actually accomplishing. It's it's exciting on the, on the surface where you, you think of a whole lot of communities developing their own energy solutions. That, that's exciting. I, I love that. But what the heck is it? Mm-hmm. Well, thank you uh, very much for that, Steve. And thank you, everybody. This has been, uh, uh, there's a lot going on in terms of electricity. It's a, <laughs> it's a complex one. I know one that uh, I was trying to wrap my head around some of the different uh, complexities involved here. And uh, like I said, we had some, have some very uh, knowledgeable people on the call today. So that's wonderful. And we're gonna have a big long chat to export. Uh, and, and a lot has been written in the chat. Um, so, uh, like I said, we were, we will follow up with, uh, information on, you know, how you can get in touch with Steve, uh, if you want to continue on this, this conversation, if you have some more questions, if you have some more suggestions or, or things that, uh, uh, that you think could be improved in the draft legislation that he's, uh, that he's proposing. And uh, we will call it a night tonight. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much once again. And uh, make sure to tune in for our next couple of uh, off the rails sessions. Uh, we've got one coming up tomorrow with Trish Altas. She's our health and uh, wellness critic. And uh, she's gonna be proposing some legislation to reverse uh, changes that have been made in 2018 that gave the Minister of Health the ability to basically uh, change <laughs> any implementation of uh, operations or, or plans at the health PEI level. Um, so, uh, so she's she's looking to to return the authority over our health system more to the the experts, uh, kind of like we've been wisely doing during COVID. Uh, so that'll be an interesting conversation there. And next week on uh, Wednesday, the seventeenth, we've got Ola Hammerland. And Ola has uh, a background as a green architect, and he will be talking to us about the importance uh, and potential of net zero buildings. Uh, if we were to um, start building more net zero buildings, both uh, publicly and privately, how that could contribute to our uh, climate change goals. So very interesting conversations. I hope you'll join us and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.